Keith Fox, president of Business Week, and we're thrilled to host this conference for the fifth year with Digital Hollywood. So if you look around the room, you'll see that this is a world-class gathering of media. I'm looking forward to two days of intense discussions and interaction about the current and future states of our industry. I want to extend a special thanks to our keynote speakers, Robert Iger, president and CEO of Walt Disney Company, and Leslie Movement-Bez, chairman and CEO of CBS, two giants in the business who are successfully navigating the turbulent changes in their industries, which I'm sure we can all relate to. We're privileged to have them with us. Since this summit was held last year, some exciting things have happened at Business Week. I'm proud to be leading a new management team on the business side and to have been part of a relaunch of the magazine in October. That relaunch, which provided a cleaner, bolder look and improved navigation, was a direct result of what we learned from our readers and what they need in their busy lives. The fact is the world has changed and we've changed with it. Consumers have multiple information choices. Technology has created and will continue to create new ways to access that content. And the advertising and business models continue to evolve. But a few things haven't changed. Our values of editorial excellence, objectivity, and global perspective are still core to the Business Week brand, whether in print, web, mobile, video, TV, or whatever the future might bring. Engagement with our readers, viewers, and advertisers is equally essential. We strive to be an intelligent filter for what matters in business, and our reach, which is actually the highest in a decade, shows that we're succeeding. Over the next two days, you'll hear panelists from Business Week and the media industry debate topics ranging from the broad, publishing 2.0, embracing the personalized computer, and the changing face of news to the specific and tactical, widgets as a platform, legal issues in new media, and virtual worlds and the massively multiplayer games, which is a mouthful, I'm sure you'll find the discussions in the meeting rooms in the hallways to be stimulating and insightful. In just a minute, Business Week Executive Editor John Byrne will have a conversation with Mr. Iger. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about John, who will do the heavy lifting of introducing our first keynote guest. John plays a role at Business Week, guiding the integration and collaboration between the print and online editorial staffs. John has been at Business Week for about 20 years, with a detour from 2003 to 2005, where he was editor-in-chief of Fast Company Magazine, but then he came to his senses and returned to Business Week. John holds the distinction of having written the most cover stories for Business Week in our history, 57, on a variety of topics including the fairness of executive pay, the folly of management fads, and the governance of major corporations. He's also the author of eight books on business leadership and management, including his collaboration with Jack Welch, Straight from the Gut. So he is no stranger to spending time with the most successful leaders in business. He also happens to be one of the smartest and most exciting talent I've ever worked with in my career. So please welcome Business Week's executive editor, John Byrne. Well, good morning. Uh, today, we welcome a man who endured a painfully long selection process that pitted experience against change and inside knowledge against outside energy. Sound familiar? But our guest is not a presidential candidate. He is a CEO who knows more than a few things about winning a tough fight. Just two and a half years ago, furious company insiders at Disney were calling Bob Iger's appointment as CEO a ruse and a fix, nearly driving the process to the corporate equivalent of a floor fight. Some decried his selection as more of the same, how wrong they were. Since taking the reins in October of 2005, Bob Iger has increased Disney's market value by $15 billion dollars, taking the company from what many considered a dysfunctional bureaucratic behemoth to a more nimble, creative, and aggressive enterprise. Uh, and we've all benefited from 
the great entertainment that Disney has brought to us, not only through all the years, but under Bob Iger's watch. Now, this, of course, didn't happen with just a wave of the wand. A little over a year ago, Business Week wrote a feature entitled How Bob Iger Unchained Disney, detailing this remarkable turnaround. It's clear now that behind his famous calm and low-key management style is the tenacity and the boldness that has allowed him to steer Disney back to its roots as an imaginative and an innovative entertainment powerhouse. Now, modest and conciliatory are not traits one normally associates with CEOs, but Bob is known for being both. I like to think those admirable qualities come from his early days as a journalist. He was sports editor of his high school newspaper and dreamed of a career in broadcasting. Unlike me, he knew better. Uh, but he was destined to work behind the camera and started out in 1974 as a schedule coordinator for ABC Sports. He steadily rose through the ranks to become president of ABC in 1994 and he led the network through its sale to Disney in 1995. Just five years later, Michael Eisner chose him as his second in command and promoted him to president of Disney. He quickly proved his worth, deftly handling the company's international growth and smoothing over numerous feathers ruffled by Mr. Eisner. Still, few people inside or outside the company could have envisioned the transformation that Bob has orchestrated. Almost immediately after taking his job, he announced an agreement to let Apple sell ABC's television shows over the Internet, signaling a long-awaited adjustment to Disney's attitude toward new digital distribution channels. Soon after, he acquired Pixar for $7.4 billion, and a recent Barron's cover declared the magic's back at Disney. And as one company executive put it last year, after years of staggering, the company is ready to roll. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome Bob Iger. Thank you. Okay, Bob, I can't help myself. I've got to ask you the first question. What's it like to have Steve Jobs in your boardroom? <laughs> well, just imagine you're CEO of a company like the Walt Disney Company. Um, and you're focused on quality product, uh, reaching the consumer as effectively as possible, uh, bring innovation to a company and to businesses that um, require innovation. Uh, and you've got Steve Jobs not only as your largest shareholder and a member of your board, but as someone that you can get on the phone pretty readily and either seek advice or listen to advice. And so I consider myself, and, and this feeling is shared by other members of the board, but also senior management of the company, extremely fortunate to have Steve associated with Disney. And it's interesting, because think, when you think about these times for companies like this, and I know you mentioned in your very generous uh, introduction, figuring out how to move content or media onto new technology platforms is probably next to creating high quality experiences content is probably the most important thing we can do. And to tap into that kind of expertise, that instinct is extraordinary. And so we're, we're very fortunate. Bring me in the boardroom if you can. And, and can you recall uh, an insight uh, that Steve delivered that was particularly helpful to you or the rest of your board members? Well, Steve, Steve is very, very honest. He speaks his piece. And I think the most important thing, I, can't, I, I don't think I can recall uh, one um, instance of it, but uh, he has a tendency to uh, create a, or, or add a perspective on things that is not only um, refreshing because of how honest he is, but it's refreshing because the perspective is so interesting mm. and it happens and it's on a number of issues um, he's got such a fine sense of design and the importance of reaching the consumer not just with high quality product but in easily navigable ways you look at that uh, iTunes platform as one example of something 
that is just brilliant in terms of the user interface. Right. And a lot of what we do, it's not just creating great product, but figuring out a user interface uh, that gives the consumer an ability to consume that product in easy and um, very positive ways. It's, it's, it's unbelievable knowledge to have um, in our company, which is how I consider it. And, and he and I have uh, had a lot of really interesting discussions about the impact of technology on the consumer today and in the future. And it's great. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty, it's, 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 in terms of the experience that I have as a CEO, it's one of the things I'd have to highlight as you know, being enjoyable and, um, and, and really fulfilling. Now, in many ways, I kind of think the Bob Iger era at Disney really started with your embrace of Steve and your acquisition of Pixar. Because recalling the events of, at the time, uh, the, the relationship that Disney had with Pixar was broken. Um, uh, Michael Eisner was um, making public statements that I thought were quite negative towards Steve. So your, your embrace of Steve and his company and what he could do for Disney, uh, I think, was a really big deal. Now, at the time when you acquired Pixar for over $7 billion, a lot of people thought you overpaid. Did you? No, uh, we didn't overpay. It was clearly fully, fully priced. Uh, maybe that's a euphemism. Uh, you have to go back to that time. Um, there were a couple of things going on. Uh, first of all, the relationship with Pixar, which had been very, very successful and created a lot of value for Disney shareholders and the people at Disney, including Michael, who were responsible for it, deserve a lot of credit for it. I mean, we had a 10-year relationship with Pixar during that period of time, not only threw off great value from a shareholder perspective, but created great franchises, starting with Toy Story, with, you know, finding Nemo and Incredibles and Monsters, and the impact that had on multiple businesses of the company go to the theme parks and you'll see it. It, was, it was extraordinary. But that relationship was ending contractually. Whether the relationship was broken or not was not material to me. It was the fact that the contract was over. And um, a relationship that had created that great value was either needed to be replaced or needed to be extended in my mind. At the same time, when I looked at Disney Animation at that point, I saw a business that was fairly broken. We had had Ten extraordinary years of success, Michael's first ten years, great value created, Lion King, Little Mermaid, right. Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin. Uh, and then ten years of um, real struggle and challenge and that uh, destroyed value. And I thought animation was the, a core business of the Walt Disney Company. And Walt, Walt Disney founded the company based on animation back in the 20s. Uh, but for Disney to be successful, animation had to be successful. So the combination of the Pixar relationship ending and my need to see to it that Disney animation was successful and vital led us to conclude, not just me, but the senior management of the board, that purchasing Pixar, even at that price, was the right thing for us to do at that point strategically. And I would say, looking back, it exceeded our expectations, both creatively and economically. It has been a very, very um, important um, sort of aspect of the company in a sense, because not only did we end up uh, with a relationship with Pixar being extended, but the talent that exists at Pixar is incredibly rich. Right. Actually, more ways than one, <laughs> thanks to that acquisition. Uh, I was lucky. And you even had a conversation with Warren Buffett about this, right? I did talk to Warren about it, but, but when you think about getting that kind of talent, infusing a company like Disney with that talent, who are we as a company? It's not about board, who's in the boardroom as much or who's in the CEO role. It's what talent do we have at the company right. that's going to really create the value. And John Lasseter you know, would be obviously a primary name that, that comes to mind, but there are, there's a lot of talent at Pixar, and that talent is working its way into Disney very, very effectively. And as a CEO, I sleep better knowing that that talent is at the company. And it's, it shows up. When you look at our results, and again, you were generous in, in some of the statistics that you cited, that all stems from creativity and great talent. Right. Now, since you took over in 2005, 
Disney image has changed quite dramatically. And many on the street thought the company was overly cautious <coughs> in the years before you were named CEO. You changed that feeling on the street almost immediately. Why was it so important for Disney to make the bold moves that you made, Pixar among them? Well, they were. You don't make decisions like this based on image. You make them based on creating value. And so they were all based on that. But there were, there was a lot of things, there were a lot of things going on at the time. You know, we talk a lot, sometimes maybe too much, but um, about brand value and managing a global brand in what is clearly a pretty different environment today, whether it's impact of globalization or technology. And most people, most classic brand managers look at technology um, well, almost with, with a deep-rooted aversion. Mm -hmm. Technology does a few things. It typically enables competition for brands, and it changes consumer behavior. And if you're a brand manager, you don't really want consumer behavior to change. You want them to continue consuming your brand. And so people take a protectionist view toward technology when they're brand managing. I actually felt that being a projectionist or projecting the brand versus protecting the brand right. using technology was the right thing to do. Because technology does two things, for at least for Disney's brand. One, it enables you to make your content better and your experiences better. I can't think of a better example than Pixar and its use of technology to enhance the animation experience. The other thing that it does is it enables you to distribute more broadly and more effectively. And when you think about a brand, you know, two of the most important brand attributes of a brand are differentiation and relevance. Mm -hmm. Disney was differentiated, but I think we needed to differentiate ourselves even more. And using technology was one way to do that. But also relevance, being on the cutting edge of technology, whether you're using it to make a theme park attraction more memorable or, or more fun, or whether you're using it to... Um, to reach more people, being on a new platform like iTunes, that really improves relevance. And that's what we had in mind back in 2005 when I became CEO. Let's use technology to completely change the perception of the brand and to grow our business. And indeed, Disney's been one of the first companies to embrace the Internet. Uh, you put TV shows on the iPod. You launched Disney.com. You're now getting much more aggressively uh, invested and involved in social media. What's what, what's what, what's the future of social media for Disney? And it's a, it's a, you say embrace technology. As you're saying that, I realize we're not really embracing technology. We're embracing consumers. Mm. Consumers are using that technology in order for us to be relevant to consumers, in order for us to make the product either either more valuable or more accessible or just better. You got to use. You, you you have to keep the consumer in mind. You have to use technology to do that. On the social networking side, pretty interesting trend, not just among um, what, I'll, what what I'll call Gen X, Gen Y generation, but even younger people uh, to go online to participate in social networking experiences. And I realize social networking is sort of a cliche these days, but it's an experience online that you're either enter, you're entertaining yourself with others, the way we look at it. And we saw a company in, uh, called Club Penguin that was doing it quite well. Uh, it's really an online gaming world, casual gaming world that you, that you can do with others. But you can use your success or lack thereof in games to uh, acquire currency and with that currency create a better life for yourself. In Club Penguin's case, a better igloo, mostly. If you go to my igloo, and I'm not going to give you the address, but I got some pretty cool stuff igloo, in my huh? igloo. I do. Okay. I got a widescreen TV and a fireplace, and I even have a basketball hoop in it, which is pretty unique. Never been to an igloo with a basketball hoop. <clears throat> um, and so what we've been doing, we bought Club Penguin, which has been great, but we're using the, the creative team and the technology to also enable us to build other online virtual worlds and social networking experiences for other Disney franchises. And we have this coterie of, of rich franchises at the company now that people want to engage with or in, as, as part of. And this is going to allow them to be immersed even more in their franchise world. So soon you'll be able to go online to Radiator Springs, which is the mythical uh, location of the movie Cars. And your avatar in that case will be a car. And you'll 
uh, participate, you'll, you'll compete with other cars, racing will be a primary one, and you'll score points, and with that you'll buy a garage, hmm. and maybe you'll get a basketball hoop for your garage or a stereo or a widescreen TV. But you'll live in Radiator Springs with other cars, and your engagement with others and with cars will be extended significantly, which is very, very important to us because that's a franchise that has a lot of value in creating more engagement. It's great. We've done it with Pirates Online, just launched recently. Uh, we're going to do it with a new franchise we're developing called Fairies. We're doing it already with Princesses. And you can see that happening with a number of other Disney properties. And, again, it's, it's, it's embracing the consumer and using technology to do so. So right now it's a little laboratory of a business for you, right? It's, did you say recently it was like a billion-dollar business? Which for you is a laboratory. Yeah, it's well, it's not really a laboratory at this point. Uh, I'm going to generate a billion dollars in digital revenue at the company this year, and that does not include what we sell online in terms of theme park packages. And that's up from about 750 million be the year prior. It's nice growth, offers low base. Company that's about 35 billion in revenue. I guess you could argue that a billion in revenue is still pretty low, mm -hmm. but that's going to grow a lot, and it's going to grow not just domestically but globally. We're rolling out versions of Disney.com right now in the U.K., and Japan did extremely well and looking to roll it out in, um, in a more uh, sophisticated way, meaning a, 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 a Disney.com 3.0 uh, in China and in um, uh, Australia and France and Germany and Italy and you name it. And that's, going to, that's not only going to grow revenue, but it's going to grow the brand and the association with sure. the brand. What kind of growth do you expect three years from now? That $1 billion business will be what? Much bigger. Much bigger. <laughs> I like getting very similar specific. Similar growth rates historically? I, get, I like to get specific. I, I, you know, I, I, we can't predict where, where uh, technology is going to take us, but I can guarantee it's going to be a very, very important part of our business. Uh, and it will create a fair amount of growth for us. Now, some of that will be um, cannibalistic of current business, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of it will be incremental. We're going to reach. We're simply going to reach more people in more ways. And as people spend more time, thanks to technology, engaging with entertainment on a global basis and more money, that's a that's a great thing for us. And the social media piece of that is rather small, right? Yeah, I, I think um, social media for us will continue to grow, but the business that we'll do online or digital I should say online digitally is going to come in, in from many different in many different ways, both revenue wise. There'll be subscription services. There'll be direct sale, video on demand, uh, micro payments. I'm sure will exist in some form. Advertising. We've spent a lot of time developing ways that we can um, enable advertisers to reach people with our product in, on new platforms. Pretty effective. ESPN is doing a great job of that. ABC.com, another great example of that. What the Club Penguin acquisition and playing in that world has taught you what about social media and its promise? Well, first thing it's taught us is that you can't think of social media just as, a, again, a Gen X or a Gen Y phenomenon. It's not just about the 20-year-old or the 25-year-old or the 18-year-old going on Facebook or MySpace or all the different new social media sites. It's about kids. Kids are using uh, their computers and broad, broadband-enabled computers for entertainment much more than the generations before them. And we've paid heed as a company. We actually believe that the, the, the broadband-enabled computer will become a primary source of entertainment for kids in the years ahead. I see it a lot in my home. That not, now I don't think my home is necessarily typical. Both my kids have MacBook Pros, I'm get commercial for Apple, um, that, you know, wireless and fairly high speed, and that's pretty unique. But I, you know, the computer is very, very interesting for kids today. And they're, they get adept at it very quickly, and and they, and they go online to be entertained. And they, they, it's just as important to them as a TV set. Now, are you a member of Facebook or LinkedIn? Or? I have a Facebook page, but uh, I, I have two friends. Uh, <laughs> Not after this. Yeah. No, that's uh, good luck finding me. I, 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 have, I have a, a number of aliases.
And I, I use them for only for the good. You're staying in your igloo, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Stay in my igloo. <laughs> I try. I, I think it's important for uh, executives, and I have to lead the way in many respects, to experience all of this. Some do so um, begrudgingly at first, but if you look at the senior management team at Disney, they're a pretty engaged lot as it relates to technology. And uh, we spend a fair amount of time engaging with each other on new platforms because it's a good way to get to feel what the consumer is doing. Sure. I'm, I'm among them. It's fun, too. What's, what's the trick for an old media company trying to get it? Hire new people. <laughs> uh, well, that's a simple way, isn't it? But you do the trick is, is again, people. you have to right. look at technology as friend, not foe. And that's a, a change, I think, for the most part when it comes to media companies. Because the first in, in instinct is it's going to make our business more difficult. People talk about the challenge of technology. It's going to fragment audiences and erode viewership, and there'll be competition for advertising, and you name it. They look at technology in a negative way. And what we've done is completely the opposite. Let's, is it going to create challenges for our businesses? Of course. There are always going to be challenges for our businesses, but let's look at it the other way. We're going to make great product, whether it's ESPN or ABC or Disney, and we're going to use technology to make the product even better and to reach more people with it. It's that simple. And that's going to make our business better and it's going to enrich our shareholders. And to, to some extent, that's what's been going on. At the same time, it's going to change the perception of the company, right. which I think in the end creates some shareholder value too, even though that's not the primary goal. What technology also does is it creates convergence. You have competitors who weren't thought of as competitors before. Um, it makes cost of entry lower. Um, make people come out of nowhere with disruptive ideas and, and other technology. Uh, do you see Yahoo and um, Microsoft getting together or DoubleClick being acquired by Google as a direct threat in any possible way to Disney? No, not really, no. Uh, for, and for Disney, again, we, we want to make great stuff and if someone's got a successful platform out there, um, they typically need our stuff in some form. They want an association. You know, Google, uh, if you were to ask an expert at Google, you'd find that um, Disney comes up as a, a pretty popular search, search word on Google. Um, very popular. I can't mm -hmm. give you the exact number, but it's up there. Um, and... They want an association in some form. Some of that comes, you know, in effect for free to them. They don't have to pay us for someone to search for Disney, but it delivers a lot of value to us when they have, their, when they provide a consumer with really great search, and that search gives the consumer access to Disney, whether right into Disney.com or an ability to buy a vacation package or go on a cruise or find out when Ratatouille is playing at the nearest movie. Right. That creates value for us. So those platforms being strong is good for us, not bad. It's interesting. Again, the instinct is, whoa, they're going to cannibalize advertising. Well, wait a minute. You know, so they're going to sell advertising, and it's going to grow. That's, we're not going to stand in the way of that. Let's look at it a different way. If Google is successful, more and more people use it, they go, we'll go back to the user interface. The user interface is great. You type in, just go to Google, type in DIS. You're going to get an array of search results that are going to create value for us. That's phenomenal. So we actually look at ways, how can we enable that process? And how can we make it better? How can, we, how can we even serve them better search results, whether it's giving ultimately access to a video or taking them right into a Disney experience? You know, I would imagine in the last six months, searching for Hannah Montana would have been something that happened fairly often on Google. So how can we figure out a way to, again, take advantage of that? Right. Now, if you were a bomber, would you be buying Yahoo right now? I'm not Steve Bomber, so uh, I don't know. He could probably afford to do it himself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. All right. Let's, let's we watch those things from afar. It's, I think it's interesting to us, but that doesn't, doesn't change what we're doing.
Well, let's Google another uh, word in the search engine. Let's uh, Google uh, Blu-ray. You know, you've been an early backer of that technology. Uh, I recently won the format war for HE DVD. Mm -hmm. um, is Blu-ray really the answer to jumpstart? Well, Blu-ray is exciting. Um, we're the we're among the world's most successful purveyors of DVDs. Um, if you have kids, you got to own one of those things so that they can watch one of our movies a few thousand times. Uh, and they, the nice thing is they don't really wear out. You know, you can watch them whether it's the first time or the thousandth time. The quality is going to be the same. What Blu-ray does is it takes that quality one step, multiple steps higher. And but people haven't really begun to appreciate it yet, partially because it's, the install base is relatively small. But they don't know yet what the true features of that technology will be. We, we do. One, you're getting a picture that's breathtaking. You watch, well, this week, No Country for Old Men is out on Blu-ray. It was a scary movie to begin with. I don't know whether you really want to watch it on Blu-ray. I don't. Ratatouille is a better example, maybe, because you don't get the anxiety you do when you watch No Country for Old Men. It's a great experience. The picture quality is sensational, and that will be good for our business. But what people haven't seen yet is the interactive ability, capabilities of that platform. And that will add another dimension to the what I'll call the movie watching experience in the home. We're, we're actually quite excited by that. It was important for us to get that format war resolved because the only way it was going to, be, it was going to penetrate the marketplace, which is a difficult marketplace to penetrate, was if there was one format and not multiple formats. We still have our work cut out for us in terms of marketing those features. And for instance, I don't think enough people understand that a Blu-ray player will play the old or standard deaf DVD. You don't have to replace your whole library. We'd like you to, but you don't have to. It's, that's another, Blu-ray is another example of technology basically being a friend. Better experience for consumers, ultimately be better for our business. What we have to do is make great stuff that can be published on Blu-ray. Is there a way to tangibly say what, what that uh, definitive decision in the marketplace does for a Disney? I mean... I know where you're getting. You want, to, you want me to quantify it. Yes, exactly. Uh, it'll, it'll, there's been some flattening out of the DVD business um, in the States, but also globally, because you have a lot of people that own a lot of DVDs, and the buy rates in terms of number of movies bought per year come down over time as the, as the technology penetrates. Um, and then we've seen those buy rates come down, although Disney's done quite well because, again, that's where – we didn't really talk that much about the value of the Disney brand, but we did talk a little bit about differentiation. The Disney name on a film and the Disney name on a DVD of that film makes a difference. People want to own those. And so we've done fairly well in a marketplace that has started to flatten out. Mm -hmm. Blu-ray will enable that flattening out to start reversing and create some growth. But I, I can't predict how far and how fast. Right. But it, it, it will be positive, not negative. Great. There's a lot of talk about how new media is chipping away at the eyeballs for more traditional media. Yet the Disney Channel, which is now 25 years old, I guess, has created two of Disney's most successful new franchises, High School Musical. I saw a recent version in a, in a high school gym, which was actually quite good, and Hannah Montana, right? So what does it say about so-called old media's ability to still create breakthrough shows? Well, the, the old media that you speak of, television, is still a very powerful medium. And we, we denigrated by, by calling it old, which is kind of unfair, because when you watch uh, a high-def version of High School Musical on a big flat, flat panel TV that you've just bought for much less than you ever thought you'd have to pay for it, at a Walmart, that's not an old media experience. That's a new media experience. So you look at TV as an old media. Well, oh. that's not old media. That's new media. My five-year-old son doesn't look at it as old media new media, actually. That's media to him. But, you know, we think that um, what I'll call more mature platforms still are, uh, can generate a lot of value. That includes the big screen movie experience in a theater. And that that value actually grows because of new media. Because what we do is you, you introduce it to the world on 
a more traditional platform. And then you use what I'll call new, or what you're calling new media, to reach more people and create more dimension to it. So the things you can do now, High School Musical in Hannah, Montana, new media, including watching episodes. I don't think I have any downloaded on my iPhone. I don't think we'll look at them today, but, you know, you want to watch an episode of it on here. Now, I know it's not as good an experience as watching it on a 50-inch flat panel TV, but right. to kids it en enables engagement more places more often. That's a good thing. Original content from the Internet, what would constitute a success for Disney in that space? Well, we are investing to create original content for new platforms, including the Internet, under multiple umbrellas, brand umbrellas, ABC and um, E Disney and ESPN. I think what would constitute a success is something that has marketplace value, meaning enough consumption to create uh, not just profitability, but the ability to exploit in multiple on multiple mm -hmm. platforms in multiple territories. It, it, when we look at things that we create these days, you, you can't create a checklist when you, when you, in the creative process and say, well, this is going to be this could be global. Uh, this could reach boys. This could reach girls. You have to just you have to create what you really believe are the right things creatively. But when you have something that you feel is a success creatively, um, I think it's really really important to sort of enable um, more reach for that product. Uh, and so when we create for original original content for the internet, the goal is to create good stuff. But ultimately, the goal is to be able to sort of export that stuff to different platforms, not just the Internet, for the company. Now, we're not suggesting that everything we make in short form for the Internet is become, going to become a theme park attraction. But as a company, we have the ability to leverage success in more ways than most of our competitors, and the goal is to do just that. Let's talk a little bit about the Disney brand, its value, its vulnerabilities, um, when, because when I think of Disney, I think of the quintessential American brand. I put it up here with Coca-Cola and McDonald's. And you think about all the anti-Americanism feeling out there in the world today. How, how has it affected the brand, and how do, how do you fight that? Well, I, I think it's nice of you to list us uh, with Coca-Cola and McDonald's as a as a true global brand, which we we believe we are. But uh, it's a that's pretty in, good space to be in. Um, we have not felt any backlash whatsoever um, in terms of anti-American feelings, uh, and that's a, that says a lot about Disney. And I think what it, what it really says is that our stories and our characters tend to have universal appeal and that people view them in positive ways in general. But one of the things that we're also focused on as a company is te technology is now breaking down walls between countries and cultures, and we're finding un we get unprecedented access to markets today, access that we never expected we have before, thanks to technology. Mm. There's a misperception, though, that that dynamic is creating a one-world culture or that the world's culture is more homogenous, so kind of a world is flat culturally approach. We don't think that's true. Um, just because you have that access doesn't mean that one culture works for the world. You go to different markets, there's huge pride in local culture and a desire to own local culture and control it. And it's not just the ideology of a government, it's the ideology of a people and a culture. And we, have, we feel in order for us to succeed globally, we have to respect that. And what that means is instead of us just exporting the product that we make here uh, and creating distribution centers around the world, we believe in order for us to be vital globally, we have to actually create in markets for those markets. And so instead of creating distribution centers, we're creating creative centers. So you go to Disney in Shanghai, Moscow, uh, Mumbai, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, London, Paris, I can name a number of them. We don't view them as distribution centers. They're, they're creative centers. And what's going on in these, in these offices of Disney is creativity aimed at distribution locally. So the Disney name on something that's created in China or in Mumbai is the way we really believe, uh, blended with exporting product that we make here, but it's the way we believe we'll succeed as a global brand. So what does and, that mean? Does Mickey Mouse speak Mandarin? <laughs> what does it mean? 
Mickey Mouse is actually multilingual. I figured he was. It's not just that. Uh, in the past, it was that Mickey Mouse speaks Mandarin. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a Mickey Mouse cartoon Walt might have made in 1933 you know, would appear in French and Italian and in German and maybe even in Cantonese and in Mandarin. Well, Walt brought Snow White to China in um, the early 40s, and I, I know it wasn't in English. <laughs> um, it's not about that. If you, this past year in China, there was a Disney movie release that wasn't released in any other market in the world. It was called The Secret of the Magic Ore, and Mickey Mouse wasn't in it. There were characters that were known to the Chinese. It was a Chinese story uh, but with the Disney name on it. And that's what that's what it means. We'll continue really to bring, creating local content for local culture. Yeah, you, right. you, I mean Ratatouille, the, the Remy and Ratatouille will speak Mandarin, um, and actually we've changed, managed to change in, in Hong Kong. I, I noticed we we're changing the year of the rat because it's the year of the rat to the year of the mouse, and maybe that's a little cultural imperialism. I don't know, but it seems to be working. But. but our characters will speak, will, will be multilingual because we're dubbing high quality um, tracks onto a lot of product that we make here. But that's about being an exporter of culture and distributing what we make here globally. Uh, we're going to do that and do that well. But we have to do more than that. And that's what I talk about when I talk about creative centers um, in all those different markets. And we're going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to accomplish that over the next few years. It's a very, very important strategic initiative at our company. Now, the mayor of Shanghai, I believe, recently thought that maybe you're going to build a new theme park there. Is he right? How could I, how could, how could I contradict what the mayor of Shanghai says? Um, we've talked for a long time uh, about building a Disneyland on uh, mainland China in Shanghai and have been in discussions for a long time on the subject. Um, and it's complicated in a, for a variety of reasons, but it's something we would love to accomplish as a company at some point. But we can't, uh, we're not prepared to say anything specific in terms of the state of negotiations or discussions with the Chinese uh, on the subject. I guess he, he spoke somewhat expansively about it fairly recently. Um, it's a very dynamic market. There are 100 million people that live within two hours of Shanghai, and not all of them can afford Disneyland, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of them would, would, want to, would want to go. Right. And it's a great market for us already as a company, and it could be a better market for us if we have a park there. So we're going we're gonna to continue to work on it, but I can't, I can't say when or whether. Okay. Your, your international theme parks actually haven't done all that well in Paris and Hong Kong, right? I mean, you've had some profitability issues with them. Why? Well, we've had, we have three parks outside the U.S. Uh, Tokyo, which will be 25 years old, is 25 years old this year. Unbelievable success. Paris opened up in 1992, and it's doing very well now, but it took a while uh, for a variety of reasons. We, there was a miss there including an overestimate initially on how much people would spend to go, ticket mm -hmm. prices, and the park was built anticipating more revenue sooner, and that didn't occur, so there was, some, there was a, a, a debt issue. Um, but we've got the right, the right product there now. Uh, we actually just opened Tower of Terror and um, a number of Pixar derivative attractions, and this past year has been great for that park. So I Paris think it's hitting. Is, it's finally, finally hitting its stride. Yeah. Uh, it's not. It hasn't been in the black yet, but it's close. Um, been great for the brand there, of right. course. Number one tourist attraction in France because it beats the Eiffel Tower. Uh, Hong Kong is only two years old, and we had a good first year and a somewhat challenged second year. I was just there two weeks ago. And I'm pleased with the steps that we're taking, both to invest in the park, to expand, opening a small world there this April, next month. And we've added some other attractions, but also our marketing efforts have improved. When you, no matter how much research you do on a market, mm. you miss certain things. It's one of the things we've learned, that you can't, you can't understand everything you need to understand before you open a park, which is difficult because these are 
expensive propositions. And so they become works in progress when you open. The question is, how long does it take to progress enough to create real value? I'm confident that Paris is in the right place and is on the right trajectory and that Hong Kong will be a valuable asset for this company over time. And it will take some additional investment, which we're talking about, to get there, but we'll get there. What if you learn? Just by the way, just one interesting thing about Hong yeah. Kong that we, we, we just didn't, we didn't appreciate. Uh, when people visit a theme park, in the, one of our theme parks in the United States, they spend only about 20 minutes eating. We sit down for a meal. I'm sure you've been there. You want to get back online to visit one of our attractions. So you you're only eat for about 20 minutes. And, and we factored that into Hong Kong, and that guided us in terms of restaurant capacity, tables and seating and table ser and waiter service and counter service and you name it. They're spending about twice as much time eating there, about 40 minutes. That basically meant we had half the capacity we needed. We had to, mm. So we, we had to change that quickly. There were, very long, there were longer lines to eat than there were to ride Space Mountain, uh, and that's pretty long. So that's an example. Now, it, it wasn't uh, significant in terms of the impact on, the, on, the, on the, the overall bottom line, but in terms of the park experience, it wasn't great. We had to fix that. And if, in fact, you build the park in mainland China, how much will it cost? We don't know. Uh, yeah. We have, we have uh, um, not yet begun the full design process. Uh, global construction costs have gone up a lot because of competition. Look at the price of steel, price of concrete. Um, uh, so we have, to, we have to factor all that in. But how much we build, how big it is, will depend a lot on, will, will obviously um, have an impact on the cost. In Hong Kong, cost you how much? I don't think we've said publicly. I mean, I know what Hong Kong costs, but Hong Kong is a partnership with the government of Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of infrastructure tied to it, uh, landfill and transportation notably, that the government picked up, and then we picked up with them the cost to actually build the park. But it was... Significant. <laughs> <laughs> and when we when, put in about and, 300 million, uh -huh. the government invested more, and that's reflected in yeah. the ownership structure. And when, when you, will you really begin seeing a return on that? Do you think? Uh, well, I, I can't. I can't predict. Although I'm confident that it'll be a good business for both the government and for us. It's already a good business in, sense in, in, in terms of its impact on tourism to Hong Kong. About 40% of the people who visit Hong Kong come from the mainland. Uh -huh. uh, mainland tourism from the mainland was increasing anyway to Hong Kong, thanks to uh, a loosening of restrictions. But a lot of people were coming to Hong Kong to shop, which is attractive to a lot of people. Now they're coming to shop, but also to be entertained the Disney way. And so you're, you're seeing more families come. And that's good for the local economy. I, I, we're not predicting how long it'll take. Okay. The writer's strike. You helped to get the compromise among, uh, I guess, News Corp President Peter Chernin. Why did the strike have to take so long? Well, a complicated set of issues and complicated circumstance. I don't know that I could really explain why it took so long. Uh, Labor conflict is, you know, is, can be really complicated because of the issues on the table and the politics. Um, they were both existent in this case. Um, issues related to new media, very complicated mm -hmm. because they were new and, and I think somewhat misunderstood. Politics as well. It was too bad because I, I don't think it was good for the industry. I know that it wasn't good for Southern California cost the local economy billions of dollars. And um, we also had a process that was uh, unnecessarily complicated that wasn't um, quite right for the times, meaning the approach in terms of uh, settling a labor dispute was more traditional in nature and in, in these times called for a different approach, mm -hmm. which resulted in Peter and I stepping in and uh, trying to create a solution.
we feel fortunate to have been able to do, and I think it's, it's good for our business, both Disney and good for the overall business. What does it mean for the coming talks with the Screen Actors Guild? Um, well, we were successful in negotiating deals with the directors and with the actors and resolving a lot of complicated issues. And I would hope that the actors uh, would see fit to uh, not only uh, accept terms that were similar to the terms that we reached with the writers and the directors, but see fit to resolve these issues uh, without a labor dispute. I don't, think, I don't think it's good for the people of the business. And when I talk about the people, I'm not just talking about the directors and the actors and the writers, but all the people that thrive on these businesses. You know, the, the little person in this case is not just a guild covered uh, or a, a guild right. member. Uh, there are a lot of people associated with these businesses, and the strike had a really negative impact on all of them. Right. Mobile entertainment. Okay, Disney has tried twice to create its own branded phones under ESPN and Disney brands without much success. What's the future there for you? The future is good because mobile entertainment is real, meaning people are using mobile devices to be entertained in a variety of ways, casual games, primary way. We missed in both cases uh, through no fault of others, our own, um, in a couple of different ways. It doesn't suggest that mobile entertainment isn't going to work. It's just that our approach was wrong. In ESPN's case, the, market, the product was good. The marketing message wasn't right. The pricing was wrong, among other things. In the Disney case, the Disney mobile phone was a good product as well, but getting into the market through retail, you need, for the most part, you need uh, retail locations to sell the product to the consumer. Mm -hmm. And the relationship that we created wasn't effective enough in that <clears throat> case. And so we didn't have a good um, sales strategy. And, we, and that, that venture failed because of that. It wasn't because of third parties, and it wasn't because of the business of mobile entertainment. It was because of us, just mistakes. Can you go back, try it again? Well, what we've done in the ESPN's case quite effectively is we've, li we've, we've created a licensing relationship with third parties, uh, and that's been successful. And in Disney's case, we'll probably license the product, but we haven't created an overall relationship yet with one entity. And we wouldn't go back in the same way. We look to create a mobile virtual. We became a vo mobile virtual network operator in MVNO and to basically control sort of more of the system, more of the economics. But in doing so, again, we, we have responsibility over retail and marketing, and that's not what we do best. We're best at, at creating product and mm -hmm. enabling others, in this case, to sell it. Although this so is we'll, gonna... we'll go back and do something rich and mobile, but not the same. This is always going to be in a little niche market, don't you think, for you? Well, I, I, no, I wouldn't call it little and niche. It'll, be, it'll, be, it'll grow in importance globally. Uh, when I was in Beijing last, uh, I was taken through our plans there in terms of Disney presence on uh, mobile platforms. You know, there are, I don't know how many, hundreds of millions of cell phones now in China, a lot. And a lot of kids have them. And Disney being on that platform will be really important. That's not niche. Hmm. Well, how, how are sales of Disney-branded content on the iPod, for example? Good. <laughs> <laughs> a number? Uh, in about a year and a half, we've sold over 4 million movies. Now, that pales in comparison to the number of DVDs we've sold. Mm -hmm. On the TV side, somewhere I, you know, off the top of my head in the 40 to 50 million range in terms of number of episodes sold. Interestingly enough, that, that pales in comparison to the number of episodes streamed on abc.com but it's incremental to us as far as right. we're concerned people aren't watching tv shows on their ipod instead of watching abc they're watching and is so far our experience tells us in addition to so they're they're engaged with programming on a more often on a higher level they're seeing more episodes because they're more they're more accessible they're more available to them so there's no cannibalization then we haven't seen it Huh. Same thing with movies. You know, for the most part, people who are buying Disney movies on the iTunes platform are people that would buy the DVD anyway. 
uh, or would never buy the DVD but want a movie on their computer or on their iPhone. And you don't see that changing in terms of just media consumption? I think over the long run, there'll be a shift, some shift, um, particularly when it comes to uh, filmed entertainment. But it won't com shift completely. In other words, they're not going to see hard goods, meaning the DVD business, go away. Right. It'll stay vital and, and big for a long time. But electronic delivery will grow because of a few things. The technology is going to get better, enables you to buy the movie, and better than in, in terms of consuming it. The connectivity, wireless or otherwise, between your hard drive or the computer, which may just be streaming it offline, and that big screen will improve greatly. And when that happens, that'll, I think, spur more adoption, more, more, more consumption. Right. Another area where you're making a big push is video games, right? So is Disney likely to get into the consolidation game that recently saw Activision acquired by Vivendi and Electronic Arts make a bid for Take Two? Is, are you going to get in there? We're self-publishing now most of our games, and most of them are Disney branded. We bought a number of developers, not publishers, because we needed the talent to create the games at a quality level that would ensure success. Uh, and we'll probably look, continue to look opportunistically at buying development and talent. Um, we kick the tires on a variety of different acquisitions in that space and in other spaces. And, you know, we may continue to do so, but we, we don't feel a, a need to buy a publisher in order to succeed in that space. Now, a lot of the big games are violent, and uh, Disney is not necessarily known for violence. So does that constrict your ability to, to really make that a big and important business for you? No. Um, there are more young people. Well, interesting, over the last couple of years, the, the broadening of the video game demographic, meaning the console-based video game, has been pretty interesting to us. There are more young people now, thanks to platforms like the Wii and the Nintendo DS platform, and there are more girls playing. Mm -hmm. And for Disney, that's great. So it's a space that we think we can succeed in without changing our our values or our, the brand attributes. We don't have to get edgy. We don't have to get violent. That's true, by the way, for Disney across the world, no matter what platform we on, we're on. We, we don't th in order for us to be relevant, we have to be good. We have to be accessible. We don't have to be edgy right. um, at all. Now, occasionally, I think it helps to not take ourselves too seriously, to poke fun at ourselves a little bit. The movie Enchanted is a good example of that. But it's not edgy. Right. Can we expect... Disney to make another big acquisition. I mean, would you would you think about AOL, for example? <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't. Why not? I, we don't. I don't. We don't want to comment on specific acquisitions, even though I just did. <laughs> it's, just not, it's just not something that we're looking at. Uh, we're lucky as a company that we've got assets that enable us to continue to grow globally, and we don't feel a compelling need to buy something to be successful. However, we have a very strong balance sheet, and our free cash flow these past few years has been really strong and should continue to be strong. And we'll have the wherewithal uh, to buy if we feel that it can generate really strong shareholder value or strategic value or both. I mean, that's our primary criteria. But there isn't a necessity to do that. We're going to look to grow and to return capital to shareholders in a variety of ways, and if acquiring something enables that, we'll do that, and we will have the wherewithal to do that by keeping a very by, by maintaining a strong balance sheet. So, just looking at your portfolio of property, I mean, is is there a likely place where an acquisition makes more sense than another? I'm sure, there is. Now, if I were if we were in a television legal drama, I'd say something like you're leading the witness. Or <laughs> No, huh? You're not going to go there. You're just not going to go there. No you're need. in that igloo and you're going to stay there. No need to go there. Oh, I thought it, the remarks earlier, someone said this was going to be an intense session or an intense set of discussions. I think, oh, brother, intense. Why am I sitting down for that? It's starting to get intense here. No, I, we don't, again, I think this audience can appreciate that when you're in these positions, um, in projecting where we might go, what we might do, what space we might buy in or sell in isn't necessarily a healthy thing to do. Certainly not going to improve value. Right. And, and that includes 
I know I, I was impertinent in saying we weren't interested in AOL, but I think if I were to poll this audience, they would have came, come to the same conclusion. <laughs> Disney's not going to buy AOL. You've, you've worked for three incredible characters in your life. Um, Mickey Tom, Mouse? No, 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 no. <laughs> Tom, Tom Murphy, the longtime uh, chairman and CEO of Cap Cities, who I had the pleasure of working for early in my career. Uh, Rune Arledge and Michael Eisner. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you learned from the three of them. What that a great, that's it, nice of you to say that. What a great experience yeah. for someone. I've worked for three of the more talented, more respected people in the business. I worked at ABC Sports for 13 years, 10 for Rune, who taught me the value of perfectionism. I mean, he was a perfectionist, and he drove us to new heights. When, I guess maybe there's no such thing as a new height. You're either perfect or you're not, but he was amazing in that regard. He also was a true innovator. And the, he taught me the real value of innovation, uh, which is not tough. doing things the same way every time. Let's find a different way to do it, and different isn't – it's supposed to be good, but different is important and valuable and mm. great. He would say, he'd send us out on a mission. I worked on six Olympic Games and Wide World of Sports, and he would send us out on a mission, and he'd say, be great. And he actually meant it. That's really what he demanded. He was very tough, right. very demanding, um, but a great – you know, in my 20s and early 30s, Ama what an amazing man to work for. And then Tom Murphy, who, who's you know, a real mentor of mine. I just spoke to Tom yesterday. He still has an office at ABC. Uh, just a great person, uh, ethical in the extreme, um, but taught me a lot about business and shareholder value and how to analyze acquisitions and showing patience, not letting money burn a hole in your pocket, treating every dollar you spend and a corporate role as though it's your own. Right. I could think of so many things. Tolerating failure, actually, if it was a result of an honest mistake. Very, very important. Well, Tom's not the kind of guy that beats you up if you failed, if it was an, if it was an honest failure. But and that's, so think about that when you're running creative businesses. And then Michael, you know, the ultimate creative genius and CEO, blending um, creative abilities with business abilities, taking big chances, bold risks, you know, going where people never went, taking Disney to Broadway, building Disney cruise ships, the investment. I mean, you go to Orlando today, which is an amazing experience with you know, over 30,000 hotel rooms and four theme parks and two water parks and golf courses and a racetrack and a sports facility. Michael built that. It was, you know, maybe it was Walt had the vision at one point. Michael took that vision and put it on steroids. And, and that business today is as valuable as it is today because of the vision Michael had. That's... He was great. He was great to work for um, in that regard, you know. Big, bold risks, stepping up and, and ensuring quality. So I was, I've been a lucky guy. The 34 years I started at ABC, it was mentioned earlier, in 1974. It was crazy. Never expecting, by the way, that I'd get here. Uh, someone would have told me I was out of my mind if I ever thought that. Um, but to have the experience over those years to work for those people. Great. A, great so, so you have 50, you're 57, right? And you have, you have plenty, <laughs> plenty of time to go. But do you think there's any chance that Steve... Plenty of time to go where? <laughs> plenty of time to go in your job. And you, 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 do you think there's any chance at all that Steve Jobs is going to take over Disney someday? You're going to take over your job when you, when you want to give it up? I, I haven't asked him. I don't know. He hasn't expressed any desire to do that. I, I'm not a predictor. Well, Bob, we someone hope, we hope will, you hang around. Someone will run Disney after me, and I'm sure they'll be great. And Disney is Disney, by the way. It's not Iger's Disney. It's Disney. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be great CEOs in the future. And they'll be lucky to have uh, that responsibility, that title. You know, right. I th think about a, a, world or a life experience. Um, I try not to look at myself in the mirror in the morning and see that title on my forehead. That wouldn't be healthy, but... I, I will say that as a life experience, it's very, very unique. I grew up, you know, I grew up watching the Mickey Mouse Club and Davy Crockett and Spin and Marty, and I still remember my grandparents taking me to a, a movie theater in New York to see Snow White. Not in 1937 when it came out, <laughs> but when it came back in, in the 50s. And, uh, you know, to wake up one, one day and you're, the, you're running that company, it's a pretty, pretty unique experience, but try not to let it go to my head. Well, Bob, thank you. And now you're in an igloo, aren't you? <laughs> Lucky you. Yes, and it's, it's, 
It's pretty cold. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you.